But no, we want to study Matthew this quarter, and we have a strict task to cover 28 chapters in 13 weeks. But Jody has assured me that we can do it, so we'll do the best we can to get through that. I am not technologically savvy, so I have no PowerPoint, I have no book. We're just going to take the book of Matthew and read it and state the best we can. Uh, is there any announcements that need to be made? Good things, happy things, bad things, anything? Nothing? Okay, well, before we begin, let's start with a word of prayer. Lord God of heaven and earth, it is at this time we are thankful that you have given us this day to come into your house and offer our study and worship to you, Father. We're indeed thankful for this book of Matthew, which shows that your son is the Christ, the Messiah, the chosen one, the king of the Jews, but also we'll see from the study that he is the universal king who brings salvation to those who obey him. And Father, we ask that you be with us this quarter as we study your word, that we do so in a serious manner, reading and preparing beforehand, and trying to understand the best we can what you would have for us to do. We're thankful for your word, which guides us and leads us and shows us the way to heaven to be with you. Thank you, Father, for this congregation here. I ask that you continue to be with us and guide us, be with those who are struggling and be with us who can be there for them to help guide them and cover them the best we can. Father, we're thankful that we're part of a group, a family, your children, that we can depend on each other and know that we're always there for each other. Thank you for your word, Father, which the Holy Spirit has inspired for us, which we know that the Spirit has searched your very mind and revealed to us what you would have us to know. Be with us, Father. Forgive us of our sins. Thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. So this morning what we want to do is do a brief introduction to the book of Matthew and then try to cover as much of chapter 1 as we possibly can. Hopefully I will have an outline of what we will be studying during the weeks of this quarter so we can be better prepared for that as well. William Barclay, in his commentary, The First Three Gospels, said this about the book of Matthew. When we turn to Matthew, we turn to the book which may be well called the most important single document of the Christian faith. For in it we have the fullest and most systematic account of the life and teachings of Jesus. J.W. McGarvey, which may be familiar to several of you, said, in consequence of its location at the beginning of the New Testament, Matthew is more read by the people and more familiar to them than any other of the Gospels or any other book, perhaps, of the Bible. So again, you see why I say we have a strict task ahead of us this quarter. And for most of the church's history, Matthew has been the most popular of the four accounts of the biographies of Jesus. And for here on out, I'll probably refer to those four books as theologies, because they're not really gospels. And why do I say that? Because the Bible mentions there is one gospel. There is never a multiplicity of gospels. Never will you find the word gospels, plural, in the scripture. So what I like to do is consider this a biography of the birth, life, teaching, and death of Jesus. So if you would allow me, I'd like to call this the biography of Jesus by Matthew, or the gospel, if you will, according to Matthew. And this book of Matthew contains the greatest quantity of Jesus' teaching, including some of his most beloved parables, and his most famous sermon, which in turn includes some of his most well-known teachings. Think about this. Matthew includes the Beatitudes, the Lord's Prayer, the Golden Rule, so on and so forth. But it also contains the greatest number of links with Judaism in the Old Testament. Matthew, it has been estimated, probably quotes or alludes to the Old Testament more than any other book in the New Testament, except for maybe the book of Hebrews. And only Matthew records certain key events of Jesus' life. And remember in Matthew chapter 2, you have, or excuse me, Matthew 1, you have Joseph's dream that we'll look at in just a moment. We have the vision or the, the visit of the wise men in Matthew chapter 2. We have the flight into Egypt after Jesus is born in Matthew chapter 2. 
We have the killing of the infants in, Ma uh, uh, in Bethlehem in Matthew 2. We have the dream of Pilate's wife in Matthew 27. We have the detailed account of the suicide of Judas in Matthew 27. We have the resurrection of the dead in the, at the crucifixion in Matthew 27. We have the story of the bride Gaul in Matthew 28. And we have the great commission given in Matthew 28. The reason why I want to mention all of these to you is because these are not found in any other of the biographies of Jesus. And unfortunately, it's coming upon me to cover all of those in 13 weeks. What do you know about Matthew? Who wrote the gospel according to Matthew? Matthew. Thank you. I asked a question that was able to be answered. How do you know that, Blake? How do you know Matthew wrote the gospel according to Matthew? Mm, nice. Look at Matthew chapter 9 and verse 9. In Matthew chapter 9 and verse 9, Jesus has just healed a paralytic. And he sees Matthew, Matthew chapter 9 and verse 9, as Jesus went on from there, he saw a man called Matthew, Luke refers to him as Levi, sitting in the tax collector's booth, and he said to him, follow me, and he got up and followed him. Now you turn over a chapter after that to Matthew chapter 10, where you see the 12 disciples are given their instructions and you see there in verse 3, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus. So we see that his name is mentioned in this book, but Matthew is nowhere mentioned as the author of the gospel according to Matthew. So how do we know that Matthew wrote this book? I believe we have to look at the external evidence to understand that Matthew did write this book. Now, the 4th century Sinai and Vatican manuscripts both are titled Katalmathion, which means according to Matthew. The church fathers cite Matthew as its author as well. You may recognize some of these names. Eusebius, which was a church historian, and quoting Papias back in 130 AD, says that Matthew originally wrote his book in the Hebrew language. And that's important. We'll get back to that in just a moment. Irenaeus, which is another considered church father, in his book, Against Heresies, in 180 AD, wrote, Matthew also issued a written gospel among the Hebrews in their own dialects while Peter and Paul were preaching at Rome. Now, I'm not sure when Peter and Paul were in Rome together. I'm not sure that they were. But that is what... Irenaeus said. He would go on to say that Mark, Luke, and John followed Matthew in that order. Origen in 245 AD echoes the words of Papias, Eusebius, Irenaeus, and others in his commentary on Matthew. But as that Matthew was a publican and afterwards an apostle of Jesus. So what did we get from all of this? One, Matthew was originally written in Hebrew, which would be a Jewish audience. Number two, it was the first biography written about him. And number three, it was written at the time Peter and Paul were preaching in Rome. Four, Matthew was a tax collector and apostle, as we see in Matthew 10, verse 3, which we just read from. And he was the one of the apostles of the twelve called by Jesus during his earthly ministry, as we just read from and Matthew 9 and verse 9. So I believe this evidence is, is credible for at least two reasons. It is not disputed by the early writers, the church fathers, the early writers there. And two, it is unlikely that any post-New Testament writer would have named Matthew as the writer of this book if he had not written the book. So that would be my conclusion as how we know that Matthew wrote the book. Now that I've confused everyone and myself, any comments or questions up to this point on that? Yes, sir. I, I wouldn't rely on any of that. I would rely on the internal, and I would look at the subject matter 
and the subject matter does fit Matthew. But I don't rely on anything the Catholics did or said and any of these early so-called authorities because they have been really terribly wrong on some things. But you look at the subject matter. It's about the Jewish, uh, all the stories that you told, all the parables that are in there, the way it's written, it's obviously, we can go back and know that it's written in Hebrew. And all the, some of that you have absolutely internal knowledge of. So you can rely on that and you can trust that Matthew did based on that. And what the, the end result is, it, it's kind of like Hebrews who wrote that, right. you know. It doesn't matter. The Lord was inspired. Absolutely. Good points. And uh, if I had time, I'd like to address what you said, but we don't have time again. <laughs> so what was the purpose of Matthew? The purpose of Matthew. Okay. Matthew was originally written by a Jew, to Jews, about a Jew. Matthew was the writer, his countrymen are the readers, and Jesus Christ is the subject of the book of Matthew. And this book was written to show that Jesus is the king of God's people. We know this, Matthew 21, Matthew 25, Matthew 27, in addition to being the great teacher for mankind, as he is portrayed in the book of Matthew, chapter 23, chapter 26. He is the savior of sinners, which we'll get to this morning in Matthew 21, verse 21, and again alluded to in Matthew 18. These are all the things that are said about Jesus in Matthew. Matthew also teaches that Jesus himself is the fulfillment of the plan of God had it not been revealed through the Old Testament. Consider Matthew uh, chapter 5, verses 17 through 18. Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 18. Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For, I, for truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass away from the law until it is accomplished. These are Jesus. This is Jesus saying these things about himself. And most importantly, Matthew shows that the salvation offered by Jesus is not just for the Jews, but it's for all nations. Rather than being limited to the physical nation of Israel, salvation is for all people. And this is revealed for us by Matthew about Jesus. And again, if you're taking notes, I'm sorry, I don't have the PowerPoint, but that is listed throughout the book. Matthew 8, 5 through 13. Matthew 15, 21 through 28. Matthew 21, 42 through 43. And probably the most uh, popular one that we would be the most familiar with is Matthew 28, 18 through 20, where Jesus, by his own words, says that, go to all the world, teaching and baptizing people. And I'm with you always. And we made an allusion to this a, a while ago, but Matthew has the most quotations in the Old Testament than any other biographical writer that includes Mark, Luke, and John. And I believe the purpose of the numerous quotations is to prove that Jesus is who it, he is and who the Bible says that he is. So let's get into the structure of the book of Matthew. Matthew revolves around what we would consider, and most scholars say, around five collections of Jesus' teaching. And what's interesting about these five collections, they all end in the same phrase. They all end in the same manner. Jesus ends all of his teaching, his discourses, if you will, with the same phrase, when Jesus had finished these words, or so on and so forth. So uh, Matthew 7, verse 28, Matthew 11, and verse 1, Matthew 13, verse 53, Matthew 19, and verse 1, after he summarizes what happens there in Matthew 18, and then Mark, Matthew 26, and verse 1. So those sections are this. Number one, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7. Number two, the preparation and the issuing of the limited commission that was for the Jews only in Matthew chapter 10. The third one would be the, the parables in Matthew 13. The fourth is discipline and fellowship of the church, if you will, or, or his assembly, his group of people in Matthew 18. 
And the fifth one would be the destruction of Jerusalem, the end of time, including his return. Matthew 24 through 25. Okay, so before we get into Matthew chapter 1, is there any comments or questions, disagreements, or threats even? <laughs> okay, let's get into Matthew chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. The record of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And for the sake of time, let's go over to verse 17. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations, from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations, and from the deportation of Babylon to the Messiah, 14 generations. So you'll see in verses 1 through 17, a genealogy of Jesus. Matthew begins with that genealogy, and really, if we're going to be honest, this genealogy requires a knowledge of the Old Testament. Matthew is the only biography that begins with a genealogy. The genealogy of Joseph is what we are given in Matthew chapter 1, and Luke is a little bit different, you may know. In Luke chapter 3, Luke gives the genealogy of Mary. So as you notice there in verse 1, it says, The record of the genealogy or the descendant of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Right away, Matthew reveals who Jesus is. He reveals Jesus' identity. He is the Messiah. He is the Christ. He is the anointed one that, that, that was promised in the Old Testament. He is the heir of God's promises to Abraham and to David. And as the son of Joseph, Jesus was of the right ancestral lineage to be the Christ. Now, I want you to pay attention uh, to the words, son of David and son of Abraham. Now, again, we talked about this, this, this uh, book, this biography of Jesus was probably to a Jewish audience. And we can know right away that the mentions of David and Abraham show that it was a Jewish audience. And what's interesting, ten times throughout this book, that phrase is used, son of David. The Lord, in Psalm 132 and verse 11, the Bible tells us the Lord swore to David a sure oath from which he will not turn back. One of the sons of your body I will set on your throne. And the same thing is repeated in 2 Samuel 7 and also in Jeremiah 23 verses 5 through 6. So God tells David that he would have a son whose kingdom and throne would be established forever. And this is why the term son of David became a messianic term. It could only refer to Jesus. And God was giving, uh, was going to raise up a descendant from David's lineage who would establish an eternal throne and an eternal kingdom. And this is what Israel was waiting for. And this is what Matthew is saying. This is who Jesus is. Jesus is the fulfillment of the son of David. This is him. This is your long-awaited king. He is not a king of an earthly or a fleshly kingdom. But Jesus is the fulfillment of the eternal, heavenly, spiritual kingdom. And further, you notice there in verse 1 that he says he is the son of Abraham. God made a promise to Abraham. You remember back in Genesis chapter 12 and in Genesis 22. I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of the heaven and as the stars in the sand and on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gates of his enemies. And your offspring shall be all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Those words are by God to Abraham in the book of Genesis. In Genesis 12, 1 through 3. And in Genesis 22, and verses 17 through 18. We also know that it's interesting that Paul alludes to this as well in the book of Galatians. In Galatians chapter 3 and verse 16 where it says that the seeds or the descendants of Abraham are not many, but it is one. And that one is Jesus Christ. Again, showing fulfillment of what God promised to Abraham and how Jesus fulfilled that. And these blessings and promises would not be to Israel alone. And I think this is an important point. 
These promises and blessings are not just to Israel or to the Jews alone or by themselves. The whole world would be blessed through the offspring that would come from Abraham. Matthew again is stating that Jesus is the one who would come to be king. Jesus would be the one to establish God's rule, to establish God's throne. And through his kingship, every person who ever lives will be blessed through him. And since this is the last genealogy recorded, it shows that the purpose of these records was to get to Jesus. And he fulfilled them. Now there's something else I think that is interesting in the genealogy of Jesus. This genealogy records the names of five women, which by Jewish standards would not be normal. Because how were women treated or viewed in the ancient Near East? Second class. Second class. But this is important. The biography of Jesus by the pen of Matthew, through the Holy Spirit, includes five women in his genealogy and his lineage. Three are Gentile on top of that. Why are these people included? Three of those five women, you know, are scandalous women. What can you tell me about Tamar? Who was Tamar? What is she known for? She was a prostitute. Slept with Judah. Slept with Judah. Okay, so she really committed incest with Judah, didn't she? Okay, what about Rahab? What was Rahab known for? Harlotry. Harlotry. What about Bathsheba? Adultery. Adultery. Those three men are mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus. We also have Ruth. What was Ruth known for? She was Moabite. She was Moabite, but she was rewarded because of her faithfulness. And then you have Mary, who was, from all accounts, perceived as scandalous, as we'll see in just a moment, because of what happened to her. But she is regarded as faithful because she carried out God's command. So again, why are these women included in the genealogy of Jesus? So many answers could be given, but I think it comes down to this. Jesus saved. Jesus saved. Matthew 1 and verse 21. You shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. These women are his people. And they're included in his genealogy. And the message is for Jew and Gentile, male and female. This is the message, the offering, and the salvation that Jesus has come to bring. And when you think about it this way, what happened after the book of Malachi concludes? Between Malachi and Matthew, what happens? 400 years. 400 years of silence, right? So there's no more prophetic voice. There's no more God communicating with his people. For 400 years, a dark, hopeless time, right? And then Matthew begins with this meaning off and ends it with this is Jesus, my son, Emmanuel, God with us. And he comes to save his people. If you don't have goosebumps on your arm right now, are you even alive? <laughs> Let's look at verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they had come together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man, not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. Verse 20. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what has been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall 
be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. And Joseph awoke from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and Mary, and took Mary as his wife. Verse 25, but kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. So in this short recap of the birth of Jesus, it is emphasized that Mary, his mother, is a virgin, and the child inside her womb, as the Bible tells us, is by the Holy Spirit. Now, being engaged in the ancient Near East was almost as binding as marriage itself. So this was a big deal for Mary and Joseph. And naturally, Joseph did not know the source of, of Mary's conception. And the Bible tells us there in verse 19, we just read, he plans to put her away secretly. He was a righteous man, the Bible says. But as he thought about it, an angel of the Lord appears to Joseph in a dream. And what does this angel tell Joseph in this dream? Basically explain what's going on and how it happens. Okay. Yes. So he gives him the details and tells him to take Mary as his wife. And they were told to name the boy Jesus. And it's interesting that Jesus' name means Yahweh is the Savior. And that is the fulfillment of his message. He came to save his people from their sins. This is what the angel tells Joseph to do. And all of this was to fulfill God's purpose to save the world from sin. And we are blessed to participate in the same promise today. And I want you to notice something, too, that came across in my studies is interesting. You see in verse 1 and verse 21 that he will save his people from their sins. And you see in verse 23, Emmanuel, God with us. Well, how does the book of Matthew end? Look at Matthew 28, beginning in verse 18. I want to suggest to you that Matthew ends the very same way it begins. And we see Jesus fulfilling or being obedient to what his Father, God, has told him to do. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. This is Jesus. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, immersing them into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. God offers salvation through Jesus. Matthew 1 and verse 21. What is baptism or immersion for? It saves us. Emmanuel, God with us. What does Jesus say by his own words? I am with you always, even until the end of the age. So really, Matthew is a book in of itself. It begins the same way it ends. Notice verses 22 through 25. Matthew explains the miraculous nature of Jesus' birth. Now, let's go back to Isaiah chapter 7, if you wouldn't mind. Isaiah chapter 7. And Isaiah 7, beginning verse 10. And the Lord spoke again to Ahaz, saying, Ask for a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Make it deep as Sheol or high as, as heaven. And Ahaz said, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. Then he said, Listen now, O house of David. Is it too slight a thing for you to try the patience of men? that you will try the patience of my God as well. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. He told him earlier, I'm going to sign. Behold, a virgin or a young maiden will be with child and will bear a son, and you will call his name Emmanuel. He will eat curds and honey. At the time, he knows enough to refuse evil and choose good. For before the boy will know enough to refuse evil and choose good, the land whose two kings you dread will be forsaken. So with that as a background, go back to Matthew chapter 1. Look at verse 22 again. Matthew 1 verse 22. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Everything we just read in, in Isaiah said, Behold, the virgin shall be the child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means 
God with us. And Joseph awoke from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. Took Mary as his wife, but kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son, and she called his name Jesus. So what does Matthew do? Matthew in these verses here explains the miraculous nature of the birth of Jesus. The virgin birth was a fulfillment of the Old Testament prophet Isaiah. What's interesting about this? Well, from the time Isaiah wrote those words, and from the time this was written, Matthew, there's some 700 years before the birth of Jesus. And Isaiah foretold of the manner of his birth. And Matthew names Mary as the virgin in Isaiah's prophecy, and Jesus as the promised son in Isaiah's prophecy. So Isaiah said the virgin's son would be called Emmanuel, which translated means or interpreted to mean God with us. And this name reveals the divine nature of Mary's son, who Jesus is, and really it's his mission statement, what he has come to do. He was not only the son of God, but the Bible tells us he was also God in human form. Because the name Emmanuel means God with us. So he was the son of God, but he was God. And he was God in human form. And the Bible says that Joseph awakes from this dream and did as the angel said and takes Mary as his wife. And he names this child Jesus as he was told to do. So from the very outset, we see that the earthly father of Jesus has chosen to obey God. And what an example this would have been for Mary and for Jesus to see that even his earthly father obeys his heavenly father. Any comments or questions up to this point? Yes, sir. So I'm sure as you suggested, chapter one is the genealogy of Joseph. So why is Joseph's genealogy given if he's not any relation because he had to fulfill the promises given to Abraham and David, and that would have been through Joseph's seed. Does that, I don't know, does that answer that question? Yes, sir. I, I, I would say it is to establish the legal right, right okay. of Jesus through Joseph. Yes. The legality. Yeah. Yes. I also think, think that this speaks to Jews today. <coughs> They're being uh, taught. <coughs> they can relate to this immediately. Right. <coughs> right. And I think that, that is acceptable. Yes. Oh, oh, absolutely. Right. So, yes. So, through, G, through, through Joseph, we have the legal genealogy, the legal blood, if you will, of Jesus. And we combine that with what Luke says in Luke chapter 3, we have the biological side of Jesus through Mary going back to Adam and then Abraham, then David, and then Nathan, and then Mary. So I don't know if that answers your question, but I guess what I should have said is I don't know. Anything else? Any other comment, question? Okay, so the ancestry of Jesus shows that he was the promised son of David. He was the promised son of Abraham. And his miraculous birth and his divine name show that he was ultimately and most importantly, the son of God. And the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy shows that his coming was according to the plan of God. Any other comments or questions on that? Well, that's all I have prepared today. <laughs>